someone come up to you and they said, I'm thinking of starting my own studio or, you know, I think, um, you know, I might start my own thing. Yeah. What, what would you, what advice would you give them? Run to the hills. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Welcome to the Production Masters Podcast. The philosophies and techniques behind making music according to the Masters of Music Production. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Production Masters Podcast. This is Owen Gillette from Ice Cocoon and ProductionMasters.net. Thanks firstly to everyone who listened into the last episode with Jason. Seem to be getting onto a bit of a roll now with viewing and so that's awesome. Now this episode was actually recorded a little while back in 2017 and it's with the mixing extraordinaire Mike Fraser. His career goes back to perhaps the 80s, maybe slightly before, when he had a breakthrough mixing one of Aerosmith's albums. And I think that propelled him onto just a slew of credits that included everything from Brian Adams to all the ACDC stuff to Metallica, to Paradise Lost, Slipknot, Strapping Young Lad. He's one of the true greats of the mixing world and such a nice guy. We had a really, really cool chat until at the end of this episode when there was a bit of an anomaly. Um, I happened to be at my parents' place and my mum knocked on the door with my niece and two seconds later the recording glitched and cut out altogether. So it all collapsed right at the very end, but I've left it as it is because it's one of those moments where when the gremlins attack, you just can't do anything. It just happens sometimes. As always, you can listen to the podcast at productionmasters.net and you can email me at info at productionmasters.net if you have any feedback or any requests for anyone you'd like me to interview or just anything that's on your mind. You can subscribe to the podcast at iTunes, at Stitcher Radio, at CastBox and also at YouTube. So let's get into it. This is my interview with the one and only mixing legend, Mike Fraser. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Oh, hey. Hi, Owen. Hey. Oh, mate, I'm so sorry. Hey, no, no stress at all. Hey, it's like um, it's quarter past three in the afternoon on a Saturday here. So, like, oh, okay. there's, like, no stress. <laughs> thought you were going to say it's quarter past three in the morning. I'm like feeling even more guilty. <laughs> no, I've, I've done that as well, but no, fortunately not this time. Yeah. So um, what are you currently working on at the moment as in projects or whatever? Uh, actually, I'm, just, I'm just getting ready to to, uh, to start a Saturani record, go down. Uh, I think in the next two weeks I'll be heading down south to do that. Uh, but I just finished doing a band called um, Aviator Shades. Yeah. New band here, Vancouver area, really cool. Sort of like a deep purple Thin Lizzy kind yeah. of cross. Yeah. Uh, loosely, you know, mm-hmm. modern, uh, really good live. Uh, yeah. He's sort of hooked up with the, the same kind of manager from the Wild. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Wild yet, but uh, they're they're making some good noise uh, here in North America. And uh, are they Canadian? Uh, so well. Yeah, they're Canadian. They're but the city is called Kelowna, about four hours outside of um, Vancouver. Sure. And, yeah, uh, it's a good place uh, over there in the UK. So we're hoping to get them over there because I think they're going to love them over there. Cool. So, in what capacity are you involved with them? Just as their producer, or you're sort of trying to? I, I get the impression you're sort of helping to foster their sort of careers as well in some way. Well, that's what I, I'm getting more excited about nowadays. You know, there's no money in making records anymore. Yeah. So uh, I love doing music. So uh, it's more fun now getting in small these little small bands that have some, kind of something there, uh, and then going through and help develop them. You know, we did an EP with the Wild first, mm-hmm. and um, you know, just kind of develop it, and then we got it to the point said, okay, let's write a record, and we got the record done, and now they're they're doing things right, you know. They're they're really hard working band, and that's sort of what I look for is like good tunes, and you got to be hard working. You can't just the days of hey, uh, let's go get signed, and then then it's easy street. You know, those days are gone. <laughs> you know, you got to do it yourself. Uh, of course, and then um, 
um, yeah, it almost seems like you need to be able to bring something which is essentially a functioning business to whoever and say, all right, well, I'm already making this much, so they can just go, all right, if we do what we do, we can add a zero to it or something. Is that yeah. closer to the type of thing? Yes, exactly. And, you know, you hook them up with, um, uh, you know, promoters and stuff that can, because, you know, they can actually make, the band themselves can make money on merchandising and shows if, if it's done properly, you know. Yeah. Uh, Canada is very hard to tour in because it's so far, a uh, few between cities, you know, you, it's yeah. a lot of miles, a lot of hours and miles and you know, gas and all that stuff. So you've got to know that you, you're going to go and, and have a five to 800 seater and you can make some money on that, you know, instead of just paying for gas and beer money, you know. Australia is exactly the same. You've got like, a, if not, well, well, like a thousand Ks between the capital cities and then there's only like the closest one I live to Adelaide is only has a million people and then Melbourne I think might have five million and that's sort of an eight and a half hour drive away and then Sydney, yeah. Sydney's like nine hour drive from Melbourne or something so it's a it's a certainly a tough one in yeah, Australia yeah. Well, as well. Yeah, so I was over there in um, what was it April or something doing the uh, the Airborne record in Melbourne. Yeah, and uh, and I thought, oh, I'm going to stay a couple of weeks at the end of the project and you know. First time in you know my whole career I've been into Australia and I've been wanting to get down there and uh, yeah. and I was quite amazed you know one amazed at how big it is you always think it's a bit of an island and you never really notice on the map how big it is but you get down there and you're like holy shit and then I was really surprised that that Sydney was kind of only up around the bend and I thought oh I always thought Sydney was like way up north you know but it yeah. is it's it's a a 10 hour drive or something and you know or an hour and a half flight or whatever it is is that wow this is almost like being in canada and saying hey uh, you live in vancouver do you know joe from toronto it's like yeah. no <laughs> <laughs> totally totally that's it yeah no so um i've got a pretty big list of questions and we aren't necessarily gonna probably smash through all of them but we'll see how we go Nate, um, i'm all yours Nobody's around tonight, so we've got the house to ourselves. <laughs> cool. All right. So um, most of is most of what you do now mixing, or is it mixing and producing? Well, I'm, I'm mostly a mix engineer, but uh, I would say in the last uh, you know two or three years or something, I've been definitely shifting more into producing. And like I say, it's more so uh, to keep me interested, and, and I love music, and I love mixing and all that stuff. But you know, just the budget's just just can't afford me or, or they can't afford the studio. Like I don't mix in the box. I mix in a console. I don't, I don't like the mixing in the box personally. Right. That, uh, I don't like the sound of it. That was um, one of my next questions. I, I got all the pictures I've seen of you are sort of sitting in front of a massive console. So I figured that was your trip, like the mixing on a board and you know, your outboard and all that sort of stuff. So that's, yeah, that's, you know, again, it's, it's probably, that's how I learned and that's what I got used to. And to me, to confine myself to a box and, and be typing, you know, values into faders or, or maybe have a little board and doing it, it's just not the same thing. I like the big console. I like the sound of the big console. It opens up the sound. It makes it sound wide. In the box, to me, sounds like how the word sounds. It sounds like it's, it's like that. And, you know, it, yeah. it's working really good for a lot of artists right now because most of it's on computers or, or phones or, you know, uh, iPod things, yeah. But you know, you get it on any kind of stereo that I think is going to make a little bit of a comeback. You know, vinyl's making a comeback. Yeah, people are going to start buying stereo. Not necessarily spending five grand on stereos, but you know, you get a good, you know, three to eight hundred dollars stereo, and it sounds freaking great. So, of course, yeah. You take things that are missing in a box and and compressed for an, uh, an MP3 type signal, mm -hmm. and you put that on big speakers, they're going to go. Oh, <laughs> absolutely! You know? Yeah, because I'm. Uh, I have. I worked in a studio for about five years and like went through SAE and all that sort of thing. So I've worked as a professional engineer, even though I none of the projects were on labels. So it's sort of like a semi sort of, I guess, small time kind of thing. But um, just getting to work, listening to music on big monitoring, like sort of wide range monitoring. Um, it, yeah, you understand when something comes in, you start to hear, yeah, you hear how small, smaller recording is that's been brought in or you hear how 
you hear all the MP3 artifacting and uh, you, you just hear how small it is, you know, relative to yeah. how big, uncompressed, open music can sound, and how powerful that is by comparison. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and but, you know, it, it, in a way, MP3, you know, that whole technology was a bit of a blessing on in our uh, thing because it made music um, – uh, it, it, you know, people can take it wherever they want now. You know, uh, we all got sick of you know, heard stack of CDs or a CD cases into our car, and then you're trying to change it in your car, or you get the the ten CD changer, but then that always jams up. You know, so it's always yeah. a hassle to be mobile and listen to your music. So MP3s are great for that, but I think there's a world where it can all work together. Um, you mm. know, like I, I do um, every once in a while, I'll do like a, a uh, what do you call it? Not a symposium, but um, there'll be a bunch of people in the room, and I'll do a little talk. And then what I'll do is I'll bring up an MP3, a CD, and a, and a vinyl of something I've done. And I say, okay, here's the CD, and we'll play it through the big speakers in the studio. Yeah. And here's the MP3, and you can hear it kind of shut down. And then I go, okay, and here's the vinyl. And everybody always goes, wow, I never realized that because at home you can't really give it a good test because you can't adjust for all the different uh, uh, levels, you know, so yep. it's not really a fair test, but if you yep. can put the same levels and go, you know, even the, the, the most normal consumer can, can hear the difference, you know? Absol so. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that's the only way that the lower res, res stuff has gotten away with it for so long is if you're listening through a laptop, you, you can't really tell how bad it is. You can't really, or even if you listen to a great quality file and then like a poor quality, the difference is much smaller when you're listening through like a tiny, like a laptop or something, isn't it? So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, I wonder if part of the difference between hearing the, off the CD and the vinyl, though, is actually how much it wasn't destroyed in the mastering process as well, though. Like for it to be more open there's, there's, and. There's a little bit of that, but you know, I've got to say, I'm. I'm uh, I'm still a huge analog fan, and it's really hard to stay analog now. It's mostly just for the cost, you know. Like a real tape, well, here in Canada, anyways, is like three hundred dollars, and that's twenty four tracks, uh, uh, fifteen minutes at you know thirty IPS. Yep, yep. So you get fifteen minutes of music at twenty four. So it's it's a huge expense, and you can't realistically do that nowadays. But when digital came out, you know, at first we thought, hey, this is great, you know, especially when you're mastering for, for a CD, you can put stuff out of phase because on a vinyl, you put it out of phase, the needle's just going to jump out of the groove. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff you could do. Initially, we thought, hey, you know, this bottom end, we can really crank the bottom. It's not going to make the needle jump. It's all that kind of stuff. But when you really started listening to it, there was a lot of stuff lost, Um some of it was the lower sampling rates, and we've got higher sampling rates now, so it's sounding a little better and not so harsh. Mm -hmm. But the way I look at, at, at digital is sort of like the if you could compare, um, you know, neon lights, you know, in the school or in the office, and neon mm -hmm. lights, and they just they're always just irritating. You get give you a headache and all. Well, what it's doing is it's that gas, and it's flickering on and off, on and off, and your eyes don't see the flicker, yeah. and it's the same with digital. Digital, you're hearing that flicker, and it translates to distortion. The other mm -hmm. thing with digital is they, they filter it off. Uh, what is it? Above 20K and below to, uh, 20 hertz yep. is just gone. But on analog, you get subharmonics that, sure, you're not hearing 30K and 40K, but you're hearing the subharmonics sub come down, and they fill those gaps in, and that's what makes it sound smooth, punchy, silky, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not a huge fan of digital either but that's what we're working with now and that you know i am not one of those guys that oh you know a purist <laughs> like i just got i go with what's you got to do but i really miss mm. what it was uh, I th you know well I, I think you've obviously come from a time where you've heard it at its best though as well you've heard like what its real potential is of it being um you know everything done properly and how good that can actually really be and I, th I i imagine that when you sort of have that benchmark in the mind it's sort of everything seems like you're constantly stepping down would that be right or well a little bit and it's and it's trying to make it you know cheaper and more available for the public and all that stuff like you know at that point when cds were 25 30 a cd but there's only really one or two 
songs on it. Like, you know, the public was getting ripped off. You know, I'm the first one to admit that. That was that was the beginning of the end for, for what we do because you got to give public good value for their money, you know. And, and then, you know, some of the CDs got to 14 and 16 songs of nothing. I'd rather get eight great songs than 16 okay songs. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So I think that yeah. coming back a little bit more now, you know. Yeah. Um, so you don't do many projects to tape anymore? No, just, just some of the big ones, like obviously the ACDCs and stuff, uh, you know, we all insist on going to tape and yeah. and they can afford it. You know, it's a, and it, it, you know, it's a lot more work <laughs> to mm. be honest, to go to tape and make sure things are right and this and, and it's funny because I'll go, you know, a couple of years in between even turning on a tape machine and then going back to it. And it comes back to you like riding a bike, but at the same time, you're like, oh, right, this, <laughs> oh, right, alignment, oh, bias, oh, right. You know, like you've got to be more careful. <laughs> all, all those details that actually matter, yeah, make a, make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I, I, was, I think my induction at SAE was the last one to – to do recording to two inch tape so i've done i've done a really little bit of it and uh i uh it was great fun like i just think it was yeah i would i would like to and i i I like the fact i like the idea that it sort of makes people have to hopefully play their stuff right as well you know well that was that was the thing too because you only had so many tracks and you couldn't just play list it and and all that stuff and so Sometimes when your your tracks got full up, you got all your drums, bass, rhythm, guitars, maybe some vocals done, and you're doing solos. You might only have one or two tracks left to do the solo on. So you do this great solo, and the guitar player says, "Oh, I could play that better." And like, Are you sure? Because you got to go over what you just did. No, no, no. I, I know what I did. No, I'll 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 cream that one. So over that end, it's like, uh, no, nah, wasn't as good. No, no, give me another go. And then you'd be three in the morning. But then. You know, yeah. then at some point, too, your mental memory of what had was always this great thing. So, but, you know, that's a pain, uh, you know, background singing over and over it'd be hours and hours because, mm. you know, you couldn't just sort of playlist it and edit it and tune it later. Like you had to get it, get it right. Um, so when you're most, where do you do most of your mixing now? Well, there's two, uh, Sort of the two main studios in Vancouver that I do most of my stuff. Uh, one's called the Warehouse Studio. Uh, Brian Adams owns that. Right. Um, downtown Vancouver, and the other one's called the Armory. Yeah. And that was uh, Bruce Fairburn's studio. Yeah. And then when right. Bruce died, his um, his ex wife and sons uh, still carry it on, still own it, and carry it on. So those are sort of the two main ones. They both got uh, SSL boards. That's what I like to mix on. Yeah. So I'm sort of trade off between the two of them and and uh in terms of monitoring are they you um what sort of monitoring do they have in there these days like is it is it like um i don't know like a more of a full range sort of a thing where you because i know i I feel like your mixes you like to have a fat sort of bottom end to it or like that that sort of Mm -hmm. i imagine you must be mixing on something where you can hear what's happening with the bottom end well and that sort of thing like um, because well, I know some of you, funny. some of you guys, I know, kind of might be into the NS tens and all that sort of thing. But I think um, if you want to hear the bottom, yeah, yeah um, obviously you got to have the monitoring. So, well, funny enough, <laughs> uh, I am strictly only on NS tens. That's all I listen to. Um, Are you serious? They've got in both studios, they've got some really good custom, big, huge monitors. But as soon as I flip them up there, I don't know where, what the hell, what? I don't know where I'm at. And I find the big monitors are good when you're overdubbing. you got the guitar player, the bass player in the room, and they want it. So you crank, just throw my earplugs in and just crank it for them, and they can get the vibe. But when I'm mixing, I'm on the ass stands. Is that right? All, yep. Wow. Like, now, I, I hook up a subwoofer with them. Oh, okay. And so yep. I, I bounce the subwoofer because the ass stands just won't handle, especially modern bottom. And modern bottom, there's a lot of subs and a lot of that kind of stuff. So you got to have the yeah. the subwoofer going. But I keep I keep that usually pr- fairly low. Like I'll put in something that I know quite well, and then you know I'll dial in the the um, 
how much subs I, I want to hear. And I always leave it a little bit low. So I add a little bit more, Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's a little bit light. Um, but yeah, I just know how the NS10s, when you're cranking them, I just know how they fold in and they, they want to quit on you, you know? Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. I, I can really relate to it because um, I, I better stop throwing the studio I was, I was working in under the bus, but the control room was so friggin' bad and they had really great monitoring, big KRKs, like real expensive monitoring and there was no chance to trust anything other than that. there's also a pair of NS10s and it's like, I ended up like, just give me the NS10s, you know what I mean? Like I'd, because it's, it's all the things, it's like, you know, it, you take them and it's like, it, the translation's great or you can trust it, you know. So it actually yeah. makes total sense <laughs> to yeah. me, yeah. yeah. Again, I think, you know, the NS10s was something that I got used to. Like, you know, some guys will only use the KRKs or will only, you know, they have their kind of go-to thing. Yeah. But that's what they got used to. So I don't ever put those speakers down or what they're doing or try to promote NS10. It's just that's what I know and I got used to. It. And I've tried over the years to switch, like, you know, the Dyn Audios. When you first put them on, you go, oh, they sound like really good NS10s. Yeah. So I'll work a little bit on that and go and, See, I'm kind of having trouble fitting the guitar and the vocal together, and I'll switch over to the NS10s and I'll go, oh, there it is. That's so why. I'm going, why am I trying to do something? Why not just be comfortable with what you're doing, you know? Totally. So, yeah. So, uh, have you ever heard a pair of the barefoot, the, like the Micromain 27s? Have you ever heard them? You know what? I have not, and, and a bunch of guys have talked about it, but, you know, one of the problems in Vancouver is. You know, we're sort of one of the main music centers in Canada, but we're mm. still a really small city. So a city like Toronto will have all sorts of dealers. Uh, L.A. will have all sorts of de- New York has all sorts of dealers. Nashville, Vancouver do not. So if I want to try out a pair of speakers, yeah. I'll contact the manufacturer. And then they say, okay, well, uh, you have to buy them. And then if you don't like them, you can return them. It's like, well, I'm not spending that kind of money just to kind of try it out. So yeah. yeah. I'll just, we never try them out. <laughs> that's that's it. No, I was just curious because I've heard people say that they sort of sound a bit like NS10s, but with sort of more extension. You know what I mean? Like, but the actual shape of them, the sound is sort of they're sort of a bit like NS10s, like to listen yeah, to. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to try out a pair. So you know, yeah. if anything, guys are listening. <laughs> no, yeah, totally. No joke. Hey, um, so. I, uh, to, to me, when I hear your mixes, I think it's um, – I'm sure that you aren't going for the same sound every time, but I think there's some common things that I kind of hear, which is that things sound natural and powerful and um, there's not – it doesn't sound like there's a lot of excessive extra tricks and processing. So um, would that be an accurate description of how you like to hear your mixes when you're putting music together? I, oh, and I think you hit the nail on the head. That's that's me exactly. I like it to try and make it sound as natural as possible. I use very little outboard gear, um, and actually only you know a couple, maybe two or three plugins that I'm using, and that's mostly you know there's some compression I'll do on a vocal through a plugin. I like the deessers uh, every once in a while. If I have to sort of program delays, I'll use a, a plugin delay. But everything else is outboard stuff. And yeah. the way I, I kind of approached and was kind of brought up into music was, well, one, uh, back in the early days at Little Mountain Sound in Vancouver here, we didn't have hardly any outboard gear. We had you know a couple of good plates, and I think there was one or two delay units. So we had to make it sound good. So I got used to that, you know. And uh, I'm a bit of a lazy guy, too, so I don't like putting little subtle things. If you're going to put an effect on, put it on so they hear it or get rid of it. Uh, you know, a lot of guys will build lots of little subtle thing, little flanging, little bit thing that you don't really hear, but it, it does that thing and power to them for doing it. Cause you know, some of that stuff sounds great. Yeah. I can't do it. I just try and work harder with the EQ compression balances and get it to where I, I like it. Yeah. And hopefully it does. <laughs> Definitely, um, and the cause the bands that I I, I like um, like the of the albums that you've mixed, like the Paradise Lost one and the Strapping Young Lad ones. To me, I think the first time I heard the New Black, it was sort of like, oh, it actually sounds like a band playing. It doesn't sound like it's all kind of um, 
sort of multi-tracked a million times at all. You could almost believe you actually, this is what the band sounds like. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, cool. and, the, and I think a lot of that is a production of the drum. So I wanted, definitely wanted to talk to you about your, your, uh, philosophy on recording drums and mixing drums, but, um, okay. Because they sound, it doesn't sound like you're big on sound replacing and sampling and this kind of stuff. Do you? Uh, do you I'm not. I, I do it a lot. I um, uh, I get my guys to. I've got a system where we hand sound replace. I mean, we use sound replacer, but you got to cut a trigger track first, and there's a whole process you got to do to make it right. You know, I've tried all sorts of the sample replacement plugins and stuff, and none of them do it correctly to my ear yeah sometimes they'll flam sometimes each or every other hit is out of phase and it just and it's just it drives me nuts i want it to sound real but what i do is I, I add a sample to enhance the real drums and i make sure the real drums are are the main thing yeah and um you know if, if i want good body out of a snare drum and a good crack sometimes the recorded snare will either have the crack or the body but not both. It's really hard to get both. Yeah. So whatever it's lacking, I will get a couple of samples and compare them and try and get the best one that fits with that snare drum. Sometimes you got to tune the sample to get it in with the track and all that stuff. And, you know, sometimes you'll add a crack or a certain kind of thing to it. And then, you know, sometimes you'll need the body. So that's what I try to replace on real drums is, or enhance is what it's missing. But I yeah. want the real drums to the lead because yeah. there's nothing worse. You know, we all did it in the 80s when you could first start sampling with the AMSs and stuff. Yeah. You know, you know this robot yeah. uh, snare fill thing. It just used to drive us nuts. So no, I like it now. It definitely comes across that you don't have any sense that you're hearing the samples in there, though. It just sounds like you're hearing a natural kit. Great. Right. Um, Good. Thank you. <laughs> which actually really appeals to me because I... Uh, I really like the natural sounds. I like to me, it's so much more interesting. Especially, I think all the heavy genres have got a way off track with drums. It's like, guys, do you actually know what a real drum kit sounds like? You know, um, that's not really what a drum kit sounds like. And uh, I think people say, oh, but you know, for this style, the drum kit should sound like clicky like this. And it's like, well, it doesn't have to. You could still have that same kind of music. And I actually, I think it sounds cool if you have a band where it's a style where it would be all processed and clicky, but you give it a natural production approach, and it's like, wow, now it's even more exciting. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I find it like a lot of metal, and I don't do a lot of metal. I've done some, and I find they're more conducive to just replace the drums, kind of, mm. because, you know, the kick drum, everything's got to be almost same value all the time, mm. you know? As soon as one sort of dips off, it's like, oh, the whole vibe of the song is kind of gone. But, you know, getting the strapping thing with a drummer like Gene, yeah, you don't have to do a lot of replacing because he's a motherfucker, he's, that guy. It's absolutely, yeah, solid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you, do, do, you remember, do you remember with the Paradise Lost album, do you remember if there was any samples in those drums or were they, was that just like the raw kit? Because it sounds really, sounds really believable that it's just the natural kit. I'm pretty sure they're samples. I, um, yeah. You know, when I first pull a song up mixing, I try and do as much as I can without putting a sound. I try not to do a sample. I don't go right to doing samples. I try not to. Let's keep, get yeah. it as far. And sometimes the mix will get, you know, three quarters or seven eighths of the way there without samples. And then once everything's kind of up, then you go, I wonder if I just put a little bit more on that kick. Oh, okay, that's cool. Oh, okay, now I need to balance that snare out a bit. And so then I'll, so usually I would say, you know, 99% of my stuff has got samples on it. Mm -hmm. So that probably did. I don't remember, but it probably did. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, um, when you, uh, I suppose we'll still talk about mixing drums. So when you're mixing drums, do you do you have a, a compressor on the drum bus? Are you compressing the overall drums? Or are you just compressing the I channels do. individually? I'll, I'll compress the kick and snare um, separately on their own channel. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes I'll, I'll put a second, the same snare track, like double patch it in and really compress that so I can add it in. Sometimes I'll do it on the kick. And then... Um, then I'll also have a uh, like a stereo compressor, and I'll send all the drum kit to that, and I'll compress that. And 
it'll depend. You know, sometimes I won't send symbols because sometimes they get a little bit too. Uh, so it'll always be kick, and then I can always add that into my drum kit. So my drum kit is a little bit, a little bit compressed, maybe kick and snare. Then I'll add in another sort of stereo kick, snare, toms, some overheads, and then individually I might, if I still need more of the snare, then I'll add in a bit of that. And then if that all isn't working, then I put a sample on it <laughs> yeah. or add a sample to it. And then uh, my, my stereo bus out is, is compressed as well with the SSL uh, bus compressor. So Right, yeah, yeah. That, that was another question I was going to ask. You do compress the master bus a bit as well? Yeah. Bus, yeah. yeah. I suppose, why wouldn't you if you've got a SSL console? <laughs> well, and I tell you, the ones on on the SSL thing, separate from the SSL um, rack mount thing, yeah, they sound completely different is on that, the board than the rack mount stuff. Is that right? Completely different. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a whole thing I actually haven't ever got to do is mix on an analog board and have a bus compressor and all that sort of thing. I've, so I, I, I find it really fascinating. It must be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's fun, yeah. Do you have an SSL in Adelaide? Yeah, there's a really beautiful studio down here called Chapel Lane, which was a, a church that was converted into a really nice studio. And they have a, I can't remember, the it's the, one of the most recent SSL consoles. So it's a really good one. And one of my friends is the engineer there. So there is one, yeah. Oh, great. Well, Owen, I see a uh, trip to Adelaide, you and me, and uh, in a mixed studio. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That'll be, that'll be fantastic. Um, sure. So uh, I wanted to touch on what about recording drums? What can we talk about with recording drums? Well, you know, I'm I'm of the world where uh, I actually, if you saw a picture of my my drum setup, um, I use quite a lot of mics. And I know there's some guys that like to use, you know, uh, is it the Glenn Johns thing? You know, the three mic thing, and yeah. you know, and they said, oh, more mics to put on drums, and you got this nightmare phasing problems and all that. Yeah. But, you know, I watch what the phasing's doing and, you mm -hmm. know, uh, adjust for it. Uh, and that's one thing I like about going away from the analog world is now I've got tracks to put my drums on. Like, I don't spread them up. I'm not crazy, but I'll do probably 14, 12 to 14 channels of drum, tracks of drums, you know, mm -hmm. kick and snare separate, top and bottom snare separate. Uh, I like the top and bottom of the toms, but right. I've got a bolt box, so... So if I've got three toms, I've only got three tom tracks, you know, but I've got six mics yeah. on them. And can I inter um, can I interrupt you there? Just out of curiosity, uh, uh, is that mm -hmm. a is that a technique you learned from Bob Rock by any chance? Uh, that one. The top and bottom tom know, thing. See Bob Rock, the top and bottom thing. I might have been uh, a Mike Stone or a, one of those other sort of more English guys, but mm. might have been Bob too. I, I don't know. <laughs> Pick it up. I seem to remember someone telling me that that's something he does as well. But um, mm. so the other mics that you've got on the drums are they to bring out more of the detail on miking individual symbols or something, or as well? Or yeah, well, I like um, like a, a close uh, depending on how many symbols the guy has. Like you know, if he's got eight symbols all the way around, I'll, I'll use a little bit more. But I usually like a stereo pair mm. of of sort of close mic like you know, maybe that far, you know, two hand widths apart kind of thing. Uh, yep. And then I put another st uh, stereo pair way up above looking at the whole, looking down on the whole drum kit. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, because, because they add, they add the, because if you get a close mic on the symbol, it just go, you yep. know, and you don't yep. really get that sustain. But if you get the, the next level, you get the sustain without getting too much of the room, you know, depending on how live the room is, you get some room, but you don't get too much of the room. And then I'll do some some room mics as well, you know. So, mm. so then the drums can sound natural um, because the problem with recording is, you know, you stand in the room with a drum and your ears are hearing everything. Like your ears are amazing with what they hear, and the phase cancels out. Yeah. And as soon as you put a, a mic, you don't put your ear right on the snare drum. Of course not. Yeah. Unless, you put, unless that's you, where you put the mic. Unless you, you hate yourself or something. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so as an engineer, you've got to trick the listener into thinking you're standing there in the room. So, in my way of thinking, the more mics I get, I have more control out of how I want that listener to hear the drums in the room. Yeah, you know, I don't want a separate snare and a separate kick. 
And I don't mind some leakage. Like, I never gate my toms. I always use them. You know, when toms are, are tuned in the way that you like a real nice long wig, boom, kind of, yeah. you know, they're all rumbling away. So I get my um, my drum text that every song, we tune the drums to the key of the song. So if they're rumbling away, they're not getting in the way of bass or anything like that uh, and creating a thing. But it, in the mix, I'll, I'll ride them, you know, sure. and I'll pull them down to 10 or 15 to be and then up when they're they're playing. So they uh, kind of do a manual gate, but if you gate them out, like I've had some mix sessions with a guy in between all the drums, they strip silence everything. Yeah, yeah. So all you're getting is kick, snare, kick, snare, tom, 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 and it's like, wow, that doesn't sound natural at all. You might as well just throw samples on there. Yeah, and maybe that's, yeah, there's maybe that's symptomatic of, I don't, I don't know, like recording in small rooms where it doesn't occur to you to that you want the room sound or I don't know. Um, but I mean, I know I know the room, the big room at the armory, that really, you can hear when someone's talking in there, there's this big sound, you know, it's this big room sound. Um, yeah. Do you, um, is that where you record most of the, your drums or? Uh, I split it in between, like at the warehouse and the tracking room is actually a, a bigger tracking room. So we end up putting the drums, especially for like ACDC stuff in a, in a, we build a little ISO room on a gobo. Like they've got gobos where you can actually build it and there's one with a door and you can put a roof on it. So you can actually build different size rooms. So I rarely use the whole uh, track room at the warehouse for drums because it is too big. Yeah. The armory can be too big. So I don't usually use too much of the room mics there because it can be kind of big. So sometimes sure. I'll back the drums down a little bit. Uh, you know, the secret of Little Mountain Sound was was we had one of the old sort of 70s style rooms, so it was quite dead. It was a big room, but it was quite dead. Yeah. But we had a wooden bay off to the side, so we used to take gobos and sort of direct the drum sound off to the side. So you had all the kick and snare in the loading bay, but not really too many cymbals. So it was great because you could add this... And, or you could have totally dry drums. So the you know, Little Mount was awesome for doing drums because you had total control. So, so do you mean that you went then and put room mics um, sort of somewhere out where you could hear the the sound going out yep. somewhere else? Wow. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Makes... It would be the same thing as like, you know, say at a studio and they had a, a smallish room, but at the back of the thing they had a stairwell, a fire escape or a stairwell or something like that. Throw a couple of mics in there and throw the door open and all you hear is this. Do you know what? But you add that to the drums and it's freaking brilliant. Absolutely, it, this is a true story. Where I, where I worked in Adelaide for years, they'd always recorded with the drums closed. And one day, I was walking up the stairwell because the studio was on this this like second floor, and the yeah. assistant that was helping me out, I said, "Man," the, and the guy was in there already playing drums. And I said, "I said, just listen to what the drums sound like just here. It actually sounds amazing just here." I said, "Plugging a mic and a couple like plugging two mic leads together and like put a mic here and." That nobody had ever yeah. thought about doing this before. The studio had been there for years. And like the first time I, I pushed up the fader in the control room and it was like, oh my God. It was like, this should have been happening from the start. This is amazing. <laughs> like it was just amazing. And, uh, you know, you've you got to do a bit of EQ sort of um, taking a bit of the ugliness out of it. But the fact that it brought all that space in, I think r totally, you know, it makes you, re makes you realize once you've, heard that it's like drums need room and they need the space don't they they just need that to yeah. to yeah. have the so what, you know, what happened at little mountain sound was um none of us had ever really used that like uh sometimes we had set a complete drum kit up in the loading bay and recorded that and then uh it wasn't until blob clear mountain came came through town and was doing the brian adams records there and he said no i want to set up the drums here in the in the drum room i says let's just open that door and uh, it wasn't quite enough level out there, so that's why he sort of built a little gobo tunnel to channel the drum sound out there. Yeah. And, he's, and then I'll record that separate. And I'm like, uh, and so since he started that, we're like, what a great idea. So every project was done that. Whether you use the loading bay mics or not, you had them if you needed to add some more verby size to the drums. And, you know, in the 80s, that's what everybody wanted was <laughs> verby drums. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. So, speaking of which, one of the questions I was curious about of mm -hmm. the on the Brian Adams albums that you worked on, did you were you mixing the songs or? 
No, and the Brian Adams stuff that I did, I was still assisting. So I was assisting Bob Clare Mountain. So, um, yeah. yeah, just whatever he wanted done, I'd help him out. Yeah, sure. Because um, I was trying to do a little bit of research before interviewing you just to... But some of the details on the internet are a little bit sketchy on exactly what's what with recordings and... Um, the same with the Metallica ones. I wasn't sure how much, uh, how much exactly, and what you did on those. Well, Metallica. The first time I worked for them was because uh, Randy Staub and Bob Rock, you know, did everything from the Black album kind of onward. Yeah. And um, the first thing I did for Metallica is I, I don't think Randy was available, so I mixed their live show called Binge and Purge, so that the big box set you yeah know, the, and all. so i mixed that whole thing so they got quite excited about that really like that uh then came time for um oh what was that freaking record load yeah so they they wanted to take their time on load i think they're spending four days a song to mix it and you know they're still doing edits and overdubs while they're mixing and they said well at the rate they were going with just Bob and Randy doing it, they said it's going to take us forever. Let's get Mike down here. So what ended up happening is we had two different studios, and they're just right across the street from each other in, in, uh, in New York. And um, so Randy mixed half the record, and I mixed half the record. So wow. that's how that started. That worked so well. We said, hey, let's do the same thing on Reload. Um, that whole project was going to be a double record, but again, it was taking so long. I said, okay, look, let's just put one of them out and then finish the rest off later, and that's what we ended up doing. But uh, It doesn't, but that, from, from memory, it doesn't really sound like, um, all the songs, are, like the mixes sound quite consistent. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? it's funny because sometimes Randy come over and, and go, ah, Lars and them are saying, you know, they, they love in the drum sound. What are you doing? So I'd go, oh, I'm doing that. Okay, well, and he'd go over, and then sometimes I'd go over, I'm pulling my hair out. No, they want my drums to sound more like what you're doing over here, or they want, you know, what are you doing on the guitar? So, you know, we, even though we weren't in the same room, we'd, we'd share each other. And, you know, we wanted it to sound consistent. But I got to say, to this day, I forget what songs I mixed. Yeah. Because usually I could listen to a song, oh, yeah, no, that's my mix. And on that record, I don't remember. <laughs> and, and the same on, I think you did something on Garage Inc. as well, the covers yeah. album. Did you yeah. did you mix all of that? I think I mixed all of that because that was for one of the they used to do the fan cans and the can of paint kind of thing. And yeah, yeah, I think I mixed all of that one. Yeah. But that was I don't mix for them. I've never recorded with them, so I don't know hmm. any of the process of the stories. You know, uh, like I said, when we we're when we we're doing load though, they were they were doing overdubs and stuff and and that. But I was more into my room and <laughs> mixing my stuff when they were doing that. Yeah, because I think I, th I think I heard Load was done to tape, but then it was the first album that they did that was also put into Pro Tools for the mix process. Is that can you is that right? Yeah, or? yeah. probably. I don't know what they did on on the Black album um, mm. that went to tape too, but I'm pretty sure that went to Pro Tools as well after yeah. tape. So I think oh, okay, they're both the same. Well, honestly, yeah. like it, it's um, I'm not just trying to um, sort of blow smoke up your backside or whatever but seriously the, those albums like and i've said this to all my friends like they are the mixes like they're they're the best sounding they're like the best sounding mixes man they're just amazing like honestly they just sound amazing hey like i really really think so like yeah totally totally a bent they're like benchmark for mixing as engineering as far as i'm concerned you know excellent I've got to say, you know, some of those kind of records, though, can be so difficult uh, to make. And, you know, if there's like tons of tracks that, that mixing is a bit of a nightmare. So you've got to really work hard at because I want to as an as an engineer, I want to hear everything. And I know as a producer, sometimes you don't need to hear everything. You just need to hear the important bits. One of them. But as an engineer, I'm always trying to hear everything. So you just pulling your even your eyebrows over your hair out to. Yeah. Oh, okay. I want to hear more bass. Put the bass, but where'd the guitars go? So you're always trying to find ways to get it all. <laughs> but when you work really hard on something, the end result is something that you go, "Wow, that is that sounds so amazing. It sounds really good." It's not for me. It's not talent. It's just 
We were freaking hard on it. Oh, look, and I'm totally, totally, of course, but only, and I'm sure it helps just having like an amazing band and it being recorded amazingly well as well. Yeah. Um, but but sure. honestly, um, nothing that's uh, none of the albums post um, that production team sound as good as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if that's just because they're partly slightly overcooked as well with so much processing and stuff. That's just what I'm hearing. Whereas, um, mm-hmm. yeah, there's just there's just a level of like um, prestige that seemed to have tapered off after that, in my humble opinion. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, you know, I gotta say, uh, I'm a huge fan of their Black album. You yeah, know, I think I love the sound of that, and I know it's it's super bright. It, yeah, like the yeah. rock and, and stuff. But it'll be interesting to hear what know, it sounded like before mastering songs or whatever. But I just love that record. You know. Oh, at, oh man, I don't think you're alone there. I think it still sells literally five thousand copies a week. Probably, yeah. And I know there's a lot of Metallica fans out there that are that they're the more the purest. And I, you know, to be honest, I never got into Metallica until the Black record, and now mm. I can listen back to some of their old stuff. Oh, that's a cool. That's, but I'm not that purist where they go. Oh, what happened to Metallica? They you know got all soft and radio and all that. You know, so. I don't get that myself because I, mm. I was never into the, the hardcore stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. So um, mm-hmm. with the with the Binge and Purge thing, was that recorded digitally? No. Uh, was it? It must have been because I don't remember, you know, 48 track uh, – Mixing on 48 track analog because that would have been no pain on that, so it must have been recorded digitally. Uh, but then, like in terms of the mixing process on that, was it like I guess what I'm getting at is like, was it did you have to comp takes together or was it was it pretty much totally live? They had a team of, of editors in, so it must have been on Pro Tools or something like that, and yeah. uh, it was pretty much live, but it was definitely. You know, nothing was replayed, but it was definitely helped. Yeah, like, and us, there was so, I guess it would have been so many shows recorded. Well, actually, no, there wasn't, was there, for that? It wasn't taken from hundreds of shows. It was only a few shows in the end, wasn't it, I think? I seem to remember most of it was, like, from Mexico or something like that. Mm. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I got that when I was, like, uh, 12, I think, when it came out, and that was, I think I might have got it for <laughs> Chris, Christmas or something. Um, so it's a bit of a... Yeah, I was a crazy Metallica fan. From, well, and I still am, always will be. But um, something that I really was interested in your opinion on is when you're recording, um, I know someone's got to make a, a call on where the line is between something breathing and having musicality and it's sort of having a bit of push and pull and where mm-hmm. where the line is where it becomes sloppy or it's substandard. Um, yeah. So... Obviously, if you eliminate all of the human side of it, then it becomes, you know, boring. But um, how and where do you draw the line with knowing it's got the right feel or it's like it's ventured into slightly sloppy territory? Do you know what I mean? Because you must yeah. have to work that <laughs> out. Know, that's, that, that's, a, that's a really tough question because yeah. over the oh – God, I've been doing this almost 40 years now. And over the 40 years, that line is constantly moving as to what's acceptable and what's not. That was the second yeah. part of the question I wanted to ask you about is that like there's there's almost like a social pressure or, or it seems to me from like the industry. It's like this is what's acceptable yeah. and you're basically going to be ostracised or laughed at or you're going to be out if you think you can be accepted doing that. You know what I mean? But I was yeah. interested in, yeah, the first part of the question but then also how you've observed those things change. So um, I'll just let you, I'll well, hand that over to you. Yeah, so, so for me, you know, back in the old days, we would spend hours and hours and hours on the tape sheet, okay, punching and punching it, and because you couldn't edit it, to try mm. and get what we're getting nowadays. You know, we wanted, you know, if the bass and, and kick flammed, oh, it was like the worst thing ever. So mm. we'd spend hours trying to get it like that. Then it got to the, you know, through the 80s and all that, and, and, uh, and then you started getting digital so that we could start sampling things, so then we could line them up and get them all sampled. Then you get, you know, um, more digital recording, you know, the Pro Tools and all that kind of stuff, mm. where you can actually go in and look at the waveforms and phase lock it all up. Well, as we all discovered, then perfection, you know, 
what we're after when we're recording is we're trying to record magic. You can't manufacture magic. So magic is playing it live. But as soon as you take that magic and change it, the magic dissipates. So now it's like, okay, it sounds more correct, but where's the magic gone? So it's that, that fine balance. But nowadays, because so much more records are done like that, mm -hmm. so, so more records have, have got the auto-tune on the vocal. Everybody, the consumer's ear is more tuned to in-tune stuff now than ever before. So anything that's slightly out of tune, they're like, oh, my God. But I tell you what, you go and listen to some of your favorite records from the 70s or even 80s and listen to some of the performing, you know, the basses and the kick drums are flamming, the vocals are out of tune. But you don't notice that because you're enraptured by the song and the magic of the song. So that that's always a very hard point to, because you know, when you're in the studio doing the record, you get blinders on it and your hearing gets more acute, more acute, and you get looking at this little thing. You've got to be able to sit back and look at the big picture, and that's sort of one of my jobs is mm -hmm. is to try and keep the big picture but then i've also got to go yeah but you know the kids are the you know the consumers are going to go uh, eh, 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 eh. so you know i don't want to make a sterile record i'm about capturing magic but at the same time i want it so that line is always shifting and it's almost record dependent or dependent on the music you know mm. some music you can a little bit more wild you know if you're doing a punk band ah let it go yeah. Uh, if you do a, a Satriani or Steely Dan record or something like that, <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be right in. Yeah. Know, so. so, so is it is it almost like a, is it almost like a just an intuitive thing in like you, you feel it like in your it, senses whether it bugs you or not, sort of thing? Or it is, it is for sure. And you know, it's funny. You know, there's some records after you know all the recording process and, and mixing it, and it finally gets out, and then you hear it on the radio, and you and there's always that one spot where you cringe, like, oh, I wish mm. we would have fixed that." Now. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, coming from coming from a musician's perspective, I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's great to aspire to be better and to be as good as you can be, and to be able to give great performances and. That should be what you're going what you're going for, but I think it's almost created a bit of paranoia as well with everything being so ludicrously, you know, because of the tools that are available, you can do crazy things. I think it's almost made as a singer. I think it's made me kind of paranoid about tuning so much that um, you know. But I also think I don't, I don't think it's realistic. I think we're actually eventually going to need to sort of loosen up again a bit with all of that and go just stop thinking and just start feeling it you know and just accept a few flaws like a few more flaws you know i mean yeah uh, and yeah, it, yeah and are you totally right about you listen to older albums uh, even some of metallica's stuff like well pre the black album and you go oh shit that that drum fill he actually played the fill too fast and came back to the one on the beat a bit early do you know what i mean or you hear you know yeah. vocals yeah. that are like oh that was actually sharp there or you know or whatever you know you hear all that stuff but um I feel like we need to accept that it actually doesn't matter. It's like, like it just got to let it go, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what's, what's happened over the years, from what I found, is because the budgets have gotten smaller, you can spend less time in the studio. Um, yeah, a lot of the kids have not become virtuosos with their instruments. You know, like uh, ACDC comes into the studio. They are so freaking, you know, they're on the other end of the spectrum, though. They are so freaking kick-ass that all the records are basically live. There's not very much editing at all. Yeah. And, and i got to say, on each song, you know, if we had to do six takes of the song, that's a that's a lot. Usually it's it's not that, that much. Yeah, and, sure. you know, there's no editing. You know, sometimes we'll punch in the bass or some of the rhythm guitars, mostly for tuning or or they got a little bit out of time, but it's always hard to, to get back to that party. They're, they're a live band, so, mm. so they've got pump and feel. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we've got these, these kids, the young kids, they write great songs, not so good musicians, they come in, well, that's where we got Pro Tools. But then that's what happens is, because they play so shitty, you've got to zap everything right to the thing, but yeah, it's hard yeah. to, it's really hard to edit something that ebbs and flows without playing it live. So Absolutely, what tends yeah. to happen is you tend to go to the grid and then yeah. you know, most guys are sitting there looking at that screen going, oh, uh, 
that's what no no listen to it no no i can see that it's out like, well, listen to it <laughs> i can see it yeah you know? and everyone wants to put it on the grid so mm. so that's what we've gravitated towards and not saying that all everybody out there nowadays plays shitty but i think they don't they don't learn their craft as well as what they should do and be able to confidently just go no i'm doing a live record in the studio yeah. let's fix a few let's, let's fix the some of the warts but let's leave the because you know the one thing i love about the acdc is you know the verse will be here and then the tempo of the chorus will just pick up slightly and then they ease back into the verse but you don't as a as a listener your head's like you don't fall down on the dance floor because they change tempos you don't really feel it or yeah. what you feel is when the chorus comes it goes yeah here we go and then the, then the verse <laughs> relaxes and you're like, yeah oh, is, and then the chorus comes well, that's what they, they just do that for you, the listener. And that's hard to edit. Yeah, you, it's hard to edit that kind of stuff. You can't. But no, of course, edit of course. Music, you know? So yeah. that's kind of where we're at now. And I think you're right. I think there's going to be a backlash of some bands that go, no, I don't want that. I don't want auto tune. I don't. So that will come back in. But like anything, you know, you've been, like I said, I've been doing this 40 years. That pendulum goes this way, and it goes back this way, and, and this is cool again. Oh, now this is cool again. So, whatever. So, so ACDC don't ever use a click in the studio. No. Well, what they'll do is they'll they'll we'll find a tempo that's working. We'll tap it out, find a, a click tempo, and then sometimes Phil will sit there with the click on for a little bit, just kind of go, and then uh, then we stop the click. Then they. Oh no, sorry. We'll play a chorus or something with a click. They'll all play, and we'll stop the click. We'll stop, and then Phil will count out, and then he'll play the song. Yeah, but yeah. No click while he's playing. So, and, and and I'm assuming they do everything like guitars, bass, and drums all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, when, rhythm guitars, bass, drums. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. And so when you're yeah. sort of grooming a band to come in to record, do you try to go for that approach? Like obviously, if they're a rock band or whatever. I do. I always have the whole band play play out the floor. Yeah. Um, yep. If I can, I'll get the singer singing too. But you know, sometimes you know, after twenty takes, it's, it's hard for a singer to keep keep going. But um, yeah. Uh, you know, like on Pro Tools, you get the singer singing, and then okay, we'll keep that track, and we'll just band will play to that now or something like that. Mm. Um, but I find that most of the time, you end up replacing most things. You keep the drums. Sometimes you can keep the bass. Yep. You know, rarely you can keep all the, the rhythm guitars. They're just not quite there or the tuning will be not not good, you know. Yep. One yep. of the more things about the modern day recording too is, you know, everybody likes to down tune to make their guitars heavier. Yep. Well, none of the instruments were made for that. So you know, yep. they're still using, you know, tens on their strings or something and you hit it and it goes really sharp and then it goes really flat and it's really hard to... It's not made that way. You know, when I did Slipknot, they had all their instruments made to be down to. Yeah. So. Well, my my band has its own, well, which is my project. To, I use baritone guitars and we're down at like F sharp and G sharp and stuff like that. And it's a, it, and then the bass is like an octave below that. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's suicide for like, for, for mixing. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's fun, but it's ridiculous. So, um. Yeah, yeah. Do you, but do you use heavier strings when you tune down like that? Oh yeah, the the lowest string on my guitar is like a eighty or whatever, so it's it's like yeah, a yeah. like a piano string. You know what I mean? So, but, but that's thing, what I'm saying. Many bands are tuned down, but still use standard tuning string. Like you yeah, know, that, no, no, you you, can, you can't do that. Or something like that, and it's like no, you got to go up to at least thirteens or fifteens or something. You know? Yeah, of course, because like there's obviously there's a there's a line between it. Um, being too thick and then it sort of just has the tone of a rubber band and then when it's a bit thinner it actually still crunches and it has the yeah. you know it doesn't go out of tune and the tension's right and yeah, yeah. but um, so um, I was going to ask you about mastering because a, a lot of engineers these days have sort of fancied themselves as also being mastering engineers but I don't think you do mastering do you? I do not no <laughs> and um, uh do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I kind of look at look like uh, I'm a baker. 
and I can bake some freaking pretty fantastic cakes, you know, fudge cakes, the vanilla cakes, chocolate cake, whatever. But I get an icer to put the freaking fancy icing on top because mm -hmm. uh, the guy, you know, I like to use uh, either Sterling Sound or Gateway, and Sterling Sound's in New York. And that was it used to be George Marino. George is no longer with us. Yeah, that's so it. So his sort of second guy was. Um, Guy named Ryan Smith. Yeah. So I'll use him, Sterling, or um, or Bob Ludwig's at Gateway, and then Bob doesn't. Well, Bob does a lot of stuff, but his guy was a guy named Adam Ian. So that's who I mostly use now. Yeah. And my philosophy in that is, is these guys probably do, you know, maybe twenty records a week, and all all the big number one stuff for the pop to the Latin to the you know, they got. So if I send them my mixes. They know instantly what's modern, what's going on, where everybody's liking things, and they listen, and they can go, oh, you just need a little 10K here and a little low end here, and I'll just do a little compression, and, and there you go. Yeah. And they usually great. If I do it, I'm going to be 10 dB at 10K. And, oh, you know, like I'll just be all over the place. I, I, I'm not a mastering guy, and I want also I want that, that sort of third vision outside because, like I say, mm -hmm. through a project, you tend to get – little blinders on, let somebody else finish it off. That's the final end of this whole project. I don't understand people that want to cheap out on that end. I want something professional and really good. Don't get your friend to do it. Don't do like, why yes. are you doing this? Amen. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think there's two, I think there's an ego component to especially younger engineers going, oh, I'm, it's mixed and mastered by me. And it's like, well, I'm pretty sure if you sent your master to a mastering engineer and like, you know, they have a listen or, or, you know, it, it's just, it's not what they think they're doing isn't actually mastering anyway when it comes down yeah. to it. I mean, you know, that's yeah. a whole, that, that's, I don't know, that seems obvious. I think, I think it's great to yeah. understand what's going on in mastering, but um, yeah. and I think yeah. it can make you a better mix engineer. Would you agree with that? Uh, I well, I think so. It's very humbling. I know the first time I had ever attended a mastering session, and you walk in there, and those rooms are so, so flat. Like you, you walk in, and and, you say, Whoa. <laughs> and then you know. So I'm sitting there behind you know George Marino, this big famous mastering engineer. First time I've ever met him. So I'm sitting there in the coach behind him. He's playing the mixes, and I'm going, "Holy, it sounds like shit!" And like, really, it sounds horrible. Like really, really bad. And I'm like. Really uncomfortable. I, I felt almost sick. I wanted to leave the room. Like, oh, I feel so embarrassed. This famous mastering guy that listened to my shitty mixes. And, you know, he went through about two or three songs and just sort of feeling it out and seeing what he could do. And then he, I remember him lighting a cigarette and, and a cup of coffee. And girl turned, turned around to me and goes, wow, he says, these sound fantastic. He says, I hardly have to do a thing to them. He says, just a couple of things. I'm like, really? But after spending the day in his room, because it's so flat, like there's no enhancements, you get used to, you can hear this little quarter dB he does. Like, mm. it, it's quite amazing in the proper mastering room how critical it is. And, mm. you know, I still think it sounds like shit, but, you know, to me, that's kind of going back circle to the Anastans. They sound like shitty speakers, but if you make them rock, it's going to rock on any set of speakers. Totally. So that's sort of the process at, at, in mastering too, like in a, in a really dead, pure sound room, nothing sounds good. You just hear everything sort of equally. There's no bottom in the hands, no top, like you don't know. You just got this flat board hitting you in the face. You know? yeah. But they know yeah. what they're doing in those rooms. And I tell you, they come out of there and it's like George was, was a master. He was a magic uh, wizard. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. And um, the, well, that's it. So I mean, to have if you don't have a room like that, and you also haven't spent thousands of hours listening in that room and really understanding what music sounds like in a room like that, then I think you're yeah. sort of ch fooling yourself if you think you're doing mastering for the most part. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know. <laughs> but um, so did you ever have you ever like taken your mixes after you got the master back and sort of level match them and listen to compare them together or Oh, all the time there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. You know, so anybody that masters for me, I, I would get the refs back, and then I compare them to the right. flat masters. Because I've talked, I've talked to a couple of guys, and they said, "Oh no, I don't, I don't even bother. Like once it's mastered, it's it's all done. There's no point in me even doing that." And it's like, well, 
I would think I would really want to do that, you know. <laughs> but um, and yeah, I, I do all the time. Yeah, for sure. And and what's uh, what's the range of some of the, th- the thoughts that you've had when you're doing that, like good, bad, oh. or anything, or. Well, I, I go through a few things because sometimes a band will come in and say, hey, you know, blah, 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 we really like this mastering guy or this guy's a friend of ours and we want to, you know, we've always heard this guy and yeah, uh, I, I'm not snobby enough that, you know, if that's what you want, here's the two guys that I recommend and who I always use, but if, whoever you want to do. So sometimes they'll come back from them and, and I'm pretty open-minded and I'll be it to my mixes. But I find on, on some guys that, that I'm not, keen on what they do like you know they may be good mastering but for me when i be to my mixes and i'll do try and do a blind blind test so i'll tell the assistant just match the levels put it out here don't tell me which one's what and i'll go a b a b a b and i'll go oh that one sounds great that one sounds too shut down there's not the thing and you go yeah that was the mastering yeah so that's when i go yeah okay i don't like it mm-hmm. when you know, um, when Adam or Ryan or any of the Sterling guys mm-hmm. sent something back, and I'll go, "Oh, I like that. That's got good, the good sparkle. It's it's exactly what I want, but it seems more enhanced." You know, yeah, yeah, that was the mastering. So that's when I know it's right. But I always, I always a b it. I always make sure. You know, some things, depending on what it is, uh, sometimes you'll go back three and four times because it's like. No, the the flat mixes without the mastering just sound better. Don't compress them. Don't do that. Don't, you know, just mm. because as a, as a mixer, I go for what I want to do. So, you know, it's funny that anybody that mixes and then thinks they can better it by mastering it is like, well, then you didn't actually mix it then, did you? Like, you didn't try your hardest. Like, if you think you can make it better by adding mastering to it, then you didn't mix it. I agree. Yeah. No, I totally. Like, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think. And your know, mastering shouldn't be like used as a, a fallback either. If someone does three quarters of a mix and then it's like, oh, it'll, they'll fix it up, or I know that I'll get away with that. Or, but um, do you find some? Have you ever found listening back to the mastered versus your mix? Does it ever bother you? Sort of the what it does to the the drums, like the the percussive aspects or the dynamic aspects of it. Well, sometimes, and what I find uh, sort of with the more modern day mixing is, is they're they're very quick to go to the the limiting and the compression. Mm. And uh, you know, like sometimes I listen back and A B my mixes and through the intro and the first verse, I go, "Fuck, this sounds really good. I really like this. I love this mastering." Yeah. And then the chorus hits them, go, "Okay, what happened to the chorus?" Because it just goes flat line. There's no open up and dynamic so okay back off on that compression don't do the compression so that's the only time it bothers me or or if it changes my balances and and the vocals are way more louder than what the guitars were if they change i balanced it how i want it you know sometimes when you're mixing you'll mix the vocal a little bit too low so sometimes i like it when mastering can pop that out a, a bit more but, you know, I've, I've done the, me and the band have done the levels we want, so don't change that. Really, all yeah. mastering should be is taking those 10 or 12 songs and putting them together so that they can all flow as a one entity. And I know in this modern day, nobody really listens to a record top to bottom, but that's still what I'm going for is, yeah. you know, I want him to, well, here's my mix, so now make it sound really crunchy and really bottomy. It's like, no, I would have done that if I was going to mix it that way, you know? Yeah, of course. And so it's like, if so, if you don't like something that's come back like that, do you, are, are you kind of, I don't know, if it's on a label or whatever, are you allowed to say, actually, guys, do you mind oh, if we redo well, this? I or? totally do. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm you know, a nice guy, but I could be a little cranky and say, hey, no, no, it sounds like shit. I don't like it change it i don't like it yeah so yeah and you know when i'm mixing stuff i usually i would say 90 percent of the time get to have that power of of i want to say and what this is you know the band's got as big a say so does the label but you know yeah. it's rarely where they will say oh mike doesn't like it but we love it oh well we'll go with it right yeah well i mean yeah surely if they're working with you they would should actually trust your opinion about it you know you'd hope so wouldn't you so yeah, but I'm only a cog of the wheel, though, too, Owen. Like, you mm-hmm. got to, 
and it's and, that, and I understand that too. So I don't overstep my bounds. I'm not very. Uh, I don't have any ego that way. I, I, I'm I'm doing it for the band. We're we're all on the team to make this the best record we can. So yeah. here's my um, on how it's going to be good. If you guys want to use that, go to it. And I'm not going to be all mad and sad about it. But you know, <laughs> but, I think it's going to be better if it's like this. So yeah, that's I'm, how I approach it. And obviously, like your objective is only for it to be as good as it possibly can be. You know. Yeah. And you're exactly. you know and you're sensitive to what makes it. To, or you're sensitive to when it is right or not. So I mean, that's yeah. I'm sure they trust that. Well, I would, you know. <laughs> so, so um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit to talk about the future of where studios and of being prof- a professional engineer is sort of going, because um, obviously mm-hmm. it has changed, like you already said, and because um, obviously with the internet and that changing everything, you know, we know why it's changed and how it's got here but what do you how do you see the future for i mean people that are wanting to be engineers and or people are thinking about making their own studios i mean and they you know to actually make a living to actually build a career i mean do you, do you think yeah. people need to be should they be would it be a good idea for them to be focused on being owner operators like having their own setup and or would you still thinking in interning or trying to get into a big studio you know i mean what do you think about all that stuff well you know my opinion is and and, you know again i've I've got i've got the old guy opinion on things but the way i see things going like it's really unfortunate a lot of the great big cool studios are going away because bands Mm. aren't using them anymore can't afford them they'll go in and cut three days of drum tracks and then go away like there's not the the four to six week projects are going into the big studios because nobody can afford that. And that's yeah. cool, you know, things up and down. Uh, then I see all these kids coming out of there's so many um, recording schools nowadays. I see these kids come out of a, a one or two year program and they go, okay, I'm a, I'm a producer, I'm an engineer right now. And it's like, okay, well, you're not really. Like, uh, you know, there, there's a thing in, in our, my belief in our industry is that is that you're, you have to do it in an apprenticeship because in in a way you're a wizard and you have to you can't just learn a couple of spells and then go up against Baltimore or whatever. You yeah. have to learn all the spells and when to use them and how to use them. Um, uh, there's a big thing that you learn in the studios and people get weeded out is um, is psychology. Like they should teach a psychology course because you've got to learn how to get along with with the most nastiest sort of ego band guys mm-hmm. and uh, and make them respond to things. So there's there's so many things that you have to learn. That uh, sorry, it's going to be a long roundabout answer to this question. Yeah. So no, that's cool. You know these 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 guys that, that are just getting out of school. They might be talented, be a good songwriter, good player. That, but you know, I'm sorry, a year and a half or two years in a school doesn't make you an engineer or producer. And yes, you have all the tools and you can chop. But well, then that's why all the records sound like this and too auto tune because they haven't learned how to let it breathe. How do we capture this magic instead of mm. trying to harness it? You know, well, you've got to. So I don't know where it's going, and I hope, I hope, I hope that the people use some of these bigger studios more because they've got all the great gear. Uh, you know, yes, you can get the freaking Teltronics plug-in and all that, but it's not the same thing as the the real thing, and people don't understand that coming. Kind of, everybody that nowadays wants the quick, the quick route. Let's just get there. Mm. Well, most times it takes an apprenticeship. Sometimes you got to be apprenticing for five to ten years and do nothing to get great. So nobody's going to be great anymore, and I'm glad I'm at the tail end of my career to be honest. You know, because. Absolutely. I don't know where it's going, and I hope, I hope, I hope they keep it going. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that it's something that's basically absent from doing the, all the engineering courses. Is there is no aspect to the looking at the psychology of it, or even the production philosophy. It's more about sort of operating the operating the the what's well, not even the knobs. It's like the the virtual yeah. knobs. But um, yeah. I, I wonder, and I do wonder if that's because. The people who are teaching it themselves have never actually literally been producers or actual professional engineers for years themselves. It's sort of like, so yeah. you can get people teaching people that, uh, um, you know what I'm saying? It's sort of, there is no yeah. foundation in it being the real thing, 
But uh, yeah. I've never been uh. at a school or to a school, so I can't comment on all that. But, you know, there's that old adage, you know, those that can do, those that can't teach. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> I sort of go along with that. <laughs> no, totally. Do you think if you were, if one, someone came to you or like one of your kids or someone said, oh, I really want to be a record producer or I want to be an engineer or someone come up to you and they said, I'm thinking of starting my own studio or, you know, I think... Um, you know, I might start my own thing. Yeah. What What would you, what advice would you give them? Run to the hills. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No. You know, it's funny. My, my youngest son came to me when, uh, I think he was still in high school, and, and uh, you know, all my kids know what I do, but it's like, oh, yeah, well, that's my dad. You know, like, it's not a big deal. Their friends are like, oh, my God, your dad worked with so-and-so. Like, you know, my kids don't give a shit. But my youngest son says, hey, Dad, you know, me and uh, one of the neighbors, we got got a little band together. Can you come and check us out? And I go, okay. So I'll go over there and listen to them. And so then my son was kind of really interested in doing it. I said, okay, great. Well, mm. uh, showed him around the studio one time. And he goes, oh, this is really cool. I'd love to do what you do. I said, okay, great. So I said, you got to finish high school. You got to get you know A's through high school. I said, you should probably go to college and at least get some business in college. And when you mm. get all done that, if you still want to get into the studio, I will help you out 100%. But until then, no. So, oh, mm. okay, great. Uh, I don't know how far along that plan he got, and he ended up in the banking world. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. Well, it's, which is probably going to be an easier way to make money, I would say. I'm just guessing. Well, yeah. And he's ultimately happier. You know, the problem with, with, with our, or, you know, my job or my thing is, is it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. Yep. So you, you have to eat and live it and it, you have to live and breathe it. You know, uh, at some of the studios now, we get um, uh, runners and assistant engineers coming out of some of the schools and they're all eager and they want to do that. And, and then they find out, oh, well, we got to, you know, sweep the floors and clean the toilets. And, and they get very disenchanted really quick because they think <laughs> they're just going to jump in and, Mm. And away they go. I said, well, that, no, that's not how it works. Like, and I'm not going to let you come in and sit in on my session until I know that you can keep my studio, the floor of the studio, sparkling and, and do your job and keep my clients happy with this coffee I always made. If we've got to come out there and go, why is there no coffee made? Like, mm. I'm not going to let you in my studio. Like, why is this not packed? Why is that not, like, you know? Yeah, and so, I, know that's, I know that's what you did with um, – okay. I can't remember the name of the studio, but I know that's your story, how you sort of got in with Bob Rock, essentially doing that type of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, the mountain, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. It started as a janitor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get and the then, um, yeah, the, and then I also, because I was actually listening to another podcast, I can't remember who it was, with you talking about how that led on to oh, you developing the work ethic and then you were sort of given the, sort of by chance ended up mixing the Aerosmith album. Yeah, yeah, just got lucky. <laughs> oh. Hi, I'm... Hello! Hello! <laughs> oh, Come, on. Get, oh. Come on in. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, this is my mum and my, nie my niece. <laughs> Hi. I was going to say, you didn't say you had kids. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're playing animals in the lounge, so that's all right. We're probably going to wrap it up fairly soon. Okay. Come on, then. Yeah. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Oh man, it's crazy times. Well, that that pretty much um, that's that's all the questions I've got. So um. great. Oh, hey, dude, I could I could go for hours too. This is this is great. This is really enjoyable. I'm, I'm really uh, really digging talking to you. You've got some great questions, and it just feels nice and natural.